Brisbane uh, University of Otago. G'day, Robert. How are you, mate? Uh, good morning, Pat. I'm fine, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. I kind of, it's a, it's a strange old day uh, for people. This is a, this is very different what we're doing now. We're jumping on board to have a bit of a chat uh, about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, this is not uh, a podcast per se. I don't know what we're going to call it. It's a doc short or something. Um, but a pretty momentous day in American politics. Um, I actually almost wonder if it's bigger than the election itself with the passing less than 24 hours ago of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, and I thought who would be better to speak to uh, than you, yourself, about her and about especially the implications for the upcoming election and the, the following term as well. Um, but for RBG herself, she was a she was a titan. She was a massive figure in the in the political world and in the in the Supreme Court world, wasn't she? Yeah, I think she was a real liberal and feminist icon in an American politics. It should be recalled. Um, that in the 1960s, um, she was in the Harvard law class and she came top out of the top 500 law students in the United States, but she was not offered a job. She was the only one who didn't get a job offer immediately, but she persisted to her credit and then got a succession of high-level law positions culminating in her appointment by President Clinton to the US uh, Supreme Court. Uh, America's top court, and she served there with distinction. Mm. And she's been mm. part, if you like, of the liberal wing of the Supreme Court. And at the moment, has been until her death, there's been a very close balance with the Conservatives with, having five to four. There's nine members of the Supreme Court. And um, that may explain why this issue has become so sensitive shortly before the election. That has big implications for the balance within the Supreme Court. Yeah, and that um, uh, that, that idea of uh, number one in the country and not getting a job, and I understand also once she had a job, she fell pregnant and she had to hide it, is actually all to do with the 14th Amendment, and that was one of the things that she was known for, the 14th Amendment, which is the amendment um, that addresses citizens' rights and equal protection under the law. A lot of people in America, and I think it would be safe to say around the world at the moment, think and, and, and accept that we are equally protected under law, uh, you know that's what the discrimination acts and, and such are all about. That you can't you can't say no, you can't do this job because you are a woman or because you are uh, or because of your age or because of your disability or whatever it is. And we look at that, we think, why wouldn't she get the job? And the answer is because she was discriminated on based on her sex. And so, yeah, a massive figure uh, in in. Uh, would it be fair to say sort of a, 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 re a readaptation or a, or a jigging of the 14th Amendment to make it more relevant for everyone? Because the reason it came in, my understanding, is really around slavery and making sure that slaves were treated the same under the law, but then lots of other people weren't. So that was that was one of her driving forces and one of the, I guess, eternal um, impacts she's had on not just America, but you know potentially through the world that we all accept that now, but certainly in the American Constitution and American law. Yes, and I, I, that's absolutely true. And she was a driving force for the legal codification of equality for women in the United States. And I think she's been recognised right across the political spectrum, not just on the, the left of the spectrum, but the right of the spectrum of being a key player. And uh, although um, Mr. Trump, his comments, uh, obviously he's pushing for her replacement immediately, he did actually, by his standards, heap fulsome praise on her. So it shows that she became a nationwide respected figure in, in what is now a, a deeply polarised society. But uh, I, I don't think we can underestimate the timing of this. Uh, America has been convulsed by um, the COVID-19 problem and the, the administration's response to that. It's been convulsed by issues of racial justice or injustice. And um, on top of that, we now have this issue uh, of the composition of the Supreme Court. Mr. Trump is very anxious to push forward. Um, some commentators and analysts have said the reason is he's already cast doubts about whether he will accept the outcome of the forthcoming November election. And he might feel more comfortable if he can convert what was previously a five to four majority for the Conservatives into a six to three one. Um, so there's a lot at stake here, and the Democrats, of course, are determined. Um, they control the House of Representatives. They're determined that this won't happen. So it, we, as you say, this is 
if America wasn't already deeply polarized, this is another issue which could really almost tip America towards the very brink of deep division. Yeah, I put a few tweets out yesterday, as most people sort of did, who who, who like this uh, genre of news, political. Um, and a couple of the replies I got was, uh, yeah, civil war is on the way. Um, it also m makes me think, potentially, this is, I feel a bit naive because... Ruth Bader Ginsburg was very sick for a very long time. I mean, the first time she got cancer was in 1999. She got another kind of cancer in 2009. She had heart surgery. She was sick again very recently, passed away at 87. I mean, it was fairly obvious. Well, I won't say fairly obvious, but I guess you'd say the odds were that she probably wouldn't have lasted through a new presidency anyway. In other words, the next four and a half years. But the, the death prior to the election has just brought it all into... Um, and, to, and to focus more how important it is, whereas many people, although, you know, friend of the show, David Pakman, has been talking a bit about how important the Supreme Court was in the conversations we've had with him, and I've seen him continue online, and this has just brought that into focus. And I wonder if um, my, my naivety with not kind of putting, not, not that I didn't put two and two together, but that it wasn't such a focus, is that this is, in my opinion, potentially... It's a nice way to hedge your bets with an opinion, doesn't it? Say so potentially at the start. Um, more important than the actual presidential election because, as we know, Supreme Courts are lifetime nominees. And I was just having a look at some of the Supreme Court nominees over the last wee while. And, um, you know, they get confirmed anywhere sort of um, 45 to 55 years of age. Well, Merrick Garland did get confirmed. He was 63. But, you know, 53 years of age, 49, 50, 54, 55. That means, you know, just going purely on statistics and the average life expectancy being 80, they're there for 20 to 30 years. Whereas whatever president is the next, if it was Trump, is there for another four. So this is really important as to what happens today. Yes, and uh, particularly in a society which is so divided now on some really social, socially basic issues. So, yeah, I mean, it, it is an extremely delicate moment and, um, you know, a lot of people, uh, I'm just wondering whether uh, Mr. Trump's undue haste to push through the replacement um, will actually backfire against him. Um, and the fact that such a, a widely respected person, such as uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, has died, has highlighted, I think, um, some of the issues which has both galvanized Mr. Trump's supporters, but also mobilized his opponents. Yeah. Um, the, the right to life, um, uh, pro-life movement and women's views that uh, I think Ruth Bader Ginsburg articulated that women have the right to control their bodies. These, these are big issues in American politics. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it's... <laughs> It's very important, I also think, that the Democrats um, show robust opposition. Um, the interesting thing is here is that it, not only could it galvanize the Democrats and their supporters, but it could also, I think, begin to open up some of the so far ra largely contained um, splits within the Republican Party. And... Um, there's at least three members of the Republican Senate that cannot be relied on or cannot it cannot be taken for granted. They will support whoever President Trump nominates. And the speculation is he will nominate someone within the next 48 hours. I wonder as well. So the, the, it's all the... very well Mitch McConnell saying, look, we're going to, you know, we're going to consider it on the floor of the Senate. But... The Republicans may have their work cut out, actually being able to deliver support for whoever's nominated. And secondly, even let's just say hypothetically, even if uh, the Republicans agree on someone that Mr. Trump nominates, perhaps Mr. Trump nominates someone more centrist than many of us imagine. And that, gal that enables unification within the Republican Party. But even in that best case scenario, um, confirmation hearings take between two to three months, which means that if you look in terms of the election timetable, it's unlikely, even given the best case scenario for a successful nomination by the, President Trump, that the whole confirmation process could be completed 
before the election. Yeah, well, I I, I um I looked up timeanddate.com and there's officially 44 days, five hours to the American election. Uh, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, it was 45 days till the election. Uh, I heard a commentator on uh, one of the news channels yesterday saying the fastest ever, um, you know, uh, appointment has been 47 days. So this would be mm. unprecedented in many ways. And they say the average uh, is about 70 days to get a, um, an appointee to the actual bench. Um, I, I wonder as well, the, the Republicans have only got three votes to lose, I believe, in the Senate. So if they lose three or more, then they, they lose majority. There are a number of Republicans who are vulnerable in their seats. There are a number of Republicans who are retiring. And I, I'm, I think it's a little bit in cowardice most of the time. You see a lot of the Republican, the sitting senators or Congress people who are critical of Trump, Trump are the ones who are also retiring. In other words, they've got nothing to yep. lose, so they speak their mind. Um, those same people within the, the Senate, uh, they're going back out into the community to do whatever. Uh, you know, what will their last action be? A legacy of hypocrisy uh, between the Merrick Garland and the, the, this nomination? Um, or will it be that their supporters are like, thank you for shoring up the Supreme Court for the next 30 years? Um, it, it, it's going to be interesting because I also wonder if this will galvanize kind of do the equal and opposite to the to the um to the left a lot of progressives have a lot of issues a number of issues with biden i wonder if this is also the you know unifying factor for getting those further left progressives um to rally behind biden and realize what they could lose if this person doesn't win so it could also work on the other side as well yeah it'll be interesting to see what happens with that yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, President Trump is one of the most partisan presidents I can remember, um, in recent memory anyway. And um, it seems to me quite, I think none of us are surprised that he's trying to get his person, his nominee in place. But like you, I, I think in politics, everything is about timing. And I think that he is so desperate to get that six to three conservative majority in the Supreme Court. He could actually, it could actually have, be a self-denying act. And what I mean by that is that I think, not only could it galvanise a lot of people who are not particularly enamoured with the Biden um, candidacy for the Democrats, as you mentioned, but I think it also, in a sense, um, it, it, it seems to me that it's going to put a lot of strains on the Republican Party at a time when Trump was just showing some signs of politically recovering after having a very bad month or so. And I'm just wondering if he's overextended himself because mm. for the reasons you've just gone through, he's putting a lot of emphasis on this with no guarantee of being able to deliver even in the best case scenario, which means, you know, I mean, if he, if he ruffles a lot of feathers between now and November and still doesn't achieve his goal, then he's got the worst of both worlds. Yeah, gotcha. So, so he'll he'll lose face as well as well as losing the appointment, and he'll appear yes. weak. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he looks desperate. Yeah. He might have been better to play to be magnanimous and say, "Well, look, um, given the Democrats showed restraint in 2016, um, I think we should do the same." And when I'm re-elected, I will nominate, you know, he, this is the sort of language he could have used. It, it's not in character with him, but I think it might have been politically shrewd, given how polarised America is at the moment. I think politically shrewd and Donald Trump don't often go in the same sentence, though, if we're, if we're fair. Um, I do say, though, I do, when I saw him, you know, he had a rally yesterday. He came off the stage after two hours and they told him. I mean, it sounds silly to go, well done, well done, lad. For, for not being a dick when you hear someone dies. He handled that particular moment quite well. It's, it's a pretty low bar that we set for Donald Trump and his response, but he handled that quite, like, not magnanimously, because it wasn't about him, but quite graciously, and, and said the right things then, and then got on the plane and probably went, oh, six to three, but didn't do it in public. So I, I, I wonder. I, look, let me give you a theory, uh, Robert. <laughs> I wonder, you're talking about being politically shrewd, I wonder if he's got more chance of being re-elected if he doesn't nominate someone till after the election. Let me explain. 
if he nominates someone before the election and they get through, what point do those moderate Republicans who kind of hate him have to vote for him? They've already got the Supreme Court. Honestly, an America under Joe Biden is going to make that much difference. If he says, I will wait till after the election, then all of those people sitting on the fence on the right will re- will have to rally behind him to get him in so we don't get, as they'll be saying, some woke left-wing ideolo- ideologue and under Joe Biden on, on the bench. I know it's probably a bit of a left 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 when I say left wing idea. I don't mean left wing as in politically. It's it's from the left. It's 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 from outfield outfield idea. But I just wonder if his chances of getting reelected would go up if he did what you're talking about. If he dangled and said, "This is what I will do after the election. If you want a six to three conservative, you know, court, you must put me back in." Yeah, I, I had some a lot of sympathy for your theory, and I think along some of the lines. But I think both of us, Pat may be assuming that as a sort of floating group in the middle of American politics, waiting to switch their vote either to the Democrats or to the Republicans, depending on the logic and the persuasiveness of what they're saying. And therefore, if President Trump is shrewd and magnanimous, or at least appears to be relatively magnanimous, then he might woo them over. But the problem is that, and this is a you know probably because we are so far from the United States in geographical terms, all the contacts I've had with American friends and colleagues recently are saying that the country's never been more polarized mm. and that, you know, you're either with us or against us. And, and Mr. Trump does operate on that basis. And I think one of the reasons to answer the, the question we both posed, why Mr. Trump will not be magnanimous and why he will not stop pushing is because his political base expects that. And he'd be worried that if he appeared to be trying to woo the center ground, he would lose those people that the you know the the political base the people who cheer him at his rallies and believe that mr trump has done a magnificent job handling covid-19 that nearly 200,000 deaths would have happened anyway um you know you've heard the the narrative um and that mr trump's the victim of the deep state <laughs> and the world's against him it's an anti-establishment plot those people are not won't be impressed if they see their candidate, the person they're proud of, miss an opportunity to entrench uh, what they see as a populist uprising in the United States. So I, I think that's why he will not take that position, because he believes that push come to shove, and he sees it as a tight race, he, na- he needs those people, you know, the people who come to his rallies, those political 30 percent i think of the population the hardcore trump supporters he needs them energized and enthusiastic so that's his key strategic priority and that is why he's going all out to get his person on the supreme court yeah a really interesting point uh, and, and i guess the 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 summary of those two kind of opposing ideas is in a political calculation would he gain more from the center being magnanimous uh, and or, or would he lose more from his base doing that? And I guess that's just mm. a calculation. Look, we we can't go we can't go past um, actually having a quick look at obviously what happened with Merrick Garland as well. And I guess I do this uh, not being naive, not going oh they'll stick by their word from you know four years ago because if one thing you learn in politics after being there for six months is that uh, you know. Uh, politicians change their position as much as they change their undies depending on their own uh, what's best for them. Let me play this for you Uh, it's from Anderson Cooper's CNN show it's just showing four years ago a few people especially Lindsey Graham who I think is quite devastating uh, to the idea of trying to put someone in now what many uh, senators from the Republican side of the things were saying when Obama was trying to put in Merrick Garland have a listen to this. I want you to use my words against me if there's a Republican president in 2016 and a vacancy occurs in the last year of the first term, you can say, Lindsey Graham said, let's let the next president, who it, whoever it might be, oh, hang on. make that nomination. You can and hear you could that? use let's my words well. against me and you'd be there absolutely we right. We're setting a precedent here today, Republicans are, that in the last year, at least of a lame duck eight-year term, I would say it's going to be a four-year term, that you're not going to fill a vacancy of the Supreme Court based on what we're doing here today. That's going to be the new rule. The next justice could fundamentally alter the direction 
of the Supreme Court and have a profound impact on our country. So of course, of course, the American people should have a say in the court's direction. I don't think we should be moving forward on a nominee in the last year of this president's term. I would say that if it was a Republican president. President Obama is eager to appoint Justice Scalia's replacement this year. But do you know in the last 80 years, we have not once has the Senate confirmed a nomination made in an election year, and now is no year to start. This is for the people to decide. I intend to make 2016 a referendum on the U.S. Supreme Court. There you go. You couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't be much, uh, much more there. Apologies that I, that I didn't put the uh, video up straight away. I missed a little bit there. But you, you, couldn't, you couldn't be much clearer as to what they thought then. And obviously, no one's expecting them to stand by their word today. But it's pretty clear. They were pretty, pretty clear in saying, don't do it. And they were basically saying, we are changing the rules for the future, that you do not put in a justice in an election year. So what happens now? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Pat. And it, 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 it dovetails nicely what we were just discussing. While Mr. Trump's decision to get, break with precedent and go all out to get his nominee confirmed for the Supreme Court before the election, while that makes sense to shore up his political base, it, where the big question mark comes in is that those people who I call instrumental voters, those people who voted for Trump, on the on the on the basis that he would be a refreshing break from the past that he would end the gridlock of washington he would drain the swamp he would make he would bring a business brain to decision making and he wouldn't be a legacy candidate like uh, uh jeb bush or hillary clinton i think they're going to be extremely concerned about mr trump's partisan behavior and his attempt um, to clearly capitalise before the election and, if you like, push through uh, with his nominee, nominee. That's the big danger for Mr Trump. He will shore up his political base, but he may well alienate people who were previously trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. That may have, because of course, he may have calculated, they've already left him. So his key mm -hmm. priority is to shore up those who are still with him. And I think that's probably from his point of view, uh, the wise calculation, because I think people who, who who believed he would drain the swamp and be a force for cleansing American politics, they've been sadly uh, relieved of that illusion. They Sorry, they've been, uh, they, they don't have any illusions on that front now. Yeah. Look, um, thanks for jumping in and having a chat with us. Just as we wrap up, there's a couple of things that have been coming up in the last 24 hours. People have been talking about, you know, you have to have a number, an odd number of justices before the election. What if it has to go to the Supreme Court? Well, they had eight Supreme Court justices for nearly a year when they wouldn't um, nominate Merrick Garland. So don't believe that hype. That's bollocks. The Supreme Court can still function fully well with eight uh, justices. So that's no reason to rush it. Uh, but the other thing is... Um, I understand that there was there's nothing in law or in the Constitution about the number of justices that you need to have. And so there is also some suggestion that should Trump nominate someone and they be put on the on the bench in the court, then Biden might come in and expand it to 13 judges or 11 judges. Now, I understand that that's been tried in recent times, like in the last 100 years, and the Supreme Court actually blocked that from happening. But what have you done any research or do you have any opinion on that, on the idea that, you know, the other way around this is for the Democrats to rally behind Biden so he can add a couple of justices to the equation? I think given the unprecedented context of 2020 and the divisions within American society and given the controversial nature of President Trump's tenure in the White House, I think, he, I think Biden, if elected... And that election looks like it's going to be incredibly controversial in itself, whether Mr. President Trump accepts the outcome. Uh, it, it, I, as far as I know, it's virtually unprecedented for a pres an incumbent president to say that he wouldn't accept the outcome <laughs> when he has clearly left a question mark there. I think Biden would come under enormous pressure if Trump is successful in getting his person onto the Supreme Court before the November election. I think Trump 
uh, Mr. Biden would become under enormous pressure to reduce because it'll be a six to three split. Mm. And some of the measures that Mr. Biden proposes could be blocked by the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, Mr. Biden's already saying he said yesterday he was asked directly a question about whether health care um, was a right or a privilege. And he said quite categorically it was a right. Now, if he's going to back that up, he is going to have to provide a much more systematic system of health care than currently exists. So you can see legal challenges looming for the sort of program. It looks like Mr. Biden, uh, particularly in the wake of COVID-19, uh, still going on, of course, and America has been convulsed by COVID-19, one of the worst countries affected in the world. Um, he's going to come under a lot of pressure for a radical program, a political program. And if he wins the election, he'll want to do that. He'll, and I think the to answer your question, I think, yes, he will be under pressure to name at least three or four new uh, nominees for the Supreme Court. I can see that happening. The other thing I was thinking, and I don't know the answer to this. If you do, let me know. If you don't, maybe this is something that will come and people, people can let us know and or I can continue doing my research. Obviously, when a president is elected in November, they take the office at the end of January. Uh, senators who are elected in November, are they basically in the office on the Monday morning? Like if it's a new senator, because I was thinking, yes, there's 44 days up to the election, but then there's a period between the election and um, you know the inauguration day. If, for, ex yeah. if for example, uh, the Democrats get control of the Senate, at you know, on the first Tuesday of November, when are those new senators active? Because equally, that could stop anything from happening. Should this process go beyond election day, do you know when they, when they a no, new, a new I, senator I don't pops have the precise in? Information yeah, I don't either. I, I, no, I mean it's an interesting question. I've been um, I've been looking around, but obviously, as soon as you search Supreme Court or you search, um, you know, Senator, uh, what have I done? Like Senator uh, occupation day or off, takes office? How long after the election? Everything that's coming up at the moment is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, so it's it's impossible to find. Because the thought was obviously, if if they if they take office, you know, supposedly on the Monday or whatever it is, you know, the, within a week or so, then the Democrats just really have to find a way to hold out till election day and try to win the senate if like the president they take office at the end of january any new senators that is then actually it's a much more difficult proposition to stop this from happening if that's what they're trying to do yes yes that's certainly a crucial question and uh yeah i mean it, it's uh, coming back to our starting point um ruth bader ginsburg's uh death unfortunately has added an additional factor uh, into a society which is so deeply divided at the moment. And um, it, it really does raise troubling questions at the moment. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think uh, I'd like to say cool heads are required, but at the moment I think passions are uh, really in gear. And it, it's, it's very difficult to see how America is going to involve, uh, avoid a constitutional crisis of some sort. I think that um, I was talking with, um, oh, well, I, I had a, a Dunedin City Council and doing a podcast. I do podcasts for other people in the studio as well. And the other day, and talking about 100,000 New Zealanders coming home because they're trying to flee COVID. I, I wonder, we always hear about people wanting to get out of America. And it seems that with the current political climate and what's been going on, that um, proposition potentially is getting more and more of a reality. Because I don't know if literal civil war is coming, but if they're if America is this divided now, imagine come the start of February, no matter what the result is going to be, what America will look like then. Goodness me. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's very true. And uh, the thing that's disconcerting to me, though, is that there are so many people highly placed in the administration who simply do not accept scientific evidence about COVID-19. And the president himself openly questions uh, Dr. Fauci's uh, she's chief scientific advisor, some of his other reflections on COVID-19, they're openly questioned by the president. There is enormous confusion in the United States about the nature of the global pandemic. And um, you have to say that 
you know, for a country with the resources America has had, it should never be in a position, particularly given the early warnings that it received, both from, the, from its own intelligence services, but also from the WHO about COVID-19. It should be never be in a situation um, where it is at the moment with so many deaths. Well, look, I don't often do this, but um, let me just show you something. Um, promoting myself here. Uh, come Thursday night, when you're talking about you don't understand about the COVID thing, we have as a, a guest on the show, 6.30pm this Thursday night live, Professor Stephen Lewandowski. Uh, he is an Australian psychologist. He has worked in the US and Australia. He is based in Bristol. I'm going to be speaking to him out of Berlin. He's the Chair of Cognitive Psychology at the School of Psychological Science. His research which originally pertained to computer simulations of people decision-making process, recently focused on public understanding of science and why ones embrace one why people often embrace beliefs that are sharply at odds with scientific um, evidence. So that's what we've got coming up on Thursday night: an expert uh, and an academic looking at why um, why people choose not to believe the science, why people choose to lean on their beliefs he also part of his expertise is looking at when your uh your beliefs are proven to be wrong how you still stay mm -hmm. tribally in your own side rather than take on the new information so the question you just posed at the end just made me think well let's let's tell people what's coming yeah, up no, on I, thursday I, I night here forward to it. i mean the political answer is of course mr trump can't accept the scientific advice because it would undermine his political narrative which is making america great again that states, great states rule the world, that things are decided in a compartmentalized fashion in the world and that there are no problems which do not recognize borders and COVID-19 comes along and drives his coach and horses through that narrative. So what do you do when you're confronted with something that undermines your narrative, you try and deny it? Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Hey, Robert, look, I know this was all a bit last minute and we chatted yesterday and stuff, but a brilliant to have you on this morning. Perfect thing for us Thank to you. do. We have the capacity and the ability to jump on and talk about big news stories. So I'm I'm excited and very, very thankful that you chose to spend what was now half an hour. We said 15 minutes, but that's difficult when you talk about this kind of stuff. What was um, a half hour chat about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, what it means for the upcoming election. I got a ton out of it from you. So thank you. I'm sure Thank other you. people did as well. And um I guess we will. I, I imagine you and I will probably talk again, either personally or professionally, in the next sort of forty-four days or whatever it was. So, uh, thanks for jumping Good in this morning. Thank you very much.